a tutorial on mixed and repeated measures factorial ANOVA. First we'll look at how to set up the data. Before we can run our analysis, we need to make sure that our data is set up properly. So the first step is to ensure that we have all the variables we need in our model. So let's start with the example of a repeated measures factorial ANOVA. So in this type of analysis, we have more than one independent variable. The independent variable is measured at the categorical level, and the design uh, for this particular variable is a repeated measures design, which means that the same people are measured in each of the different groups for that independent variable. Or uh, another way, the each of the levels of the independent variable uh, is made up of the same people. So in a factorial design, uh, we have more than one independent variable and the same people in all of the different groups for each of the independent variables. So if we use an example like this, we have the type of movie and the location where people uh, watch the movie. So in a repeated measures design, we would say, okay, uh, we, have, um, we have three types of movies. So we have comedy, drama, and action, and we have location, so home and theater. So what this means is that we asked people to watch six different movies, okay? So they watched a comedy at home, a comedy at the theater, a drama at home, a drama at the theater, an action movie at home, and an action movie at the theater. And let's say in this particular example, they reported their satisfaction of the experience at each time. So in order to represent this in SPSS, you actually have to create a variable for each of the cells since each participant was measured in all of the cells. So since each participant has data in every single cell, you need to ensure that all of these cells are in the data set. So the easiest way to do that is to set it up like this, where you actually name the variable with the cell name. So we have comedy theater, comedy home, drama theater, drama home, action theater, and action home. So in these six variables here, we actually have the two independent variables built right into them and we can see them into the, uh, the names of the variables. So essentially when you're setting up a purely repeated measures factorial design, you need to make sure that you have enough dependent variables uh, to cover all of the different cells in your design and that your participants have data on all of those measures. So now if we retake the same example, uh, let's pretend this time that instead of having the same participants uh, watch movies at home at the theater, that we have two groups, okay? So we have a group of people who watch movies at home and a group of people that watch movies at the theater, but they still watched three different types of movies. So what this would be would be a mixed design because the type of movie is still measured at the repeated level where the same people are watching all three types of movies. However, we're no longer asking those same people to watch the movies at home and the theater. We have two separate groups. So we have a home group and a theater group. So what this means is that the location variable is an independent measure because we have different people in both of these groups. So if we combine a factorial design like this, we're actually looking at a uh, mixed design because we have one variable that's measured at the repeated level and one that's measured at the independent level. So in uh, SPSS, when we're setting this up, we would have a variable to represent each of the categories of the repeated measure, and then we'd have an additional variable to create the categories on those measures for the independent measure. So with this example, we would have a variable for everyone who watched the comedy, whether they watched it at home or at the theater, everyone who watched the drama, and everyone who watched the action movie, so three, and then there'd be a fourth variable, maybe called location, where we would say, okay, this the ones are home and the twos are theater, and we would use that to divide the two groups. So in the example here, we're actually going to look at energy at the beginning, middle, and end of the semester, and how it's influenced by gender. So as you can see here, we have energy at the start, energy at the middle, energy at the end. So our three levels of our one independent variable, and then we have our gender variable here uh, as our independent measure to separate the two groups. So you can see the variables here are set up for the purely repeated design and the three variables here plus gender are set up for the mixed design. 
Now we'll look at how to run a repeated measures factorial ANOVA. Now that our data is set up, let's run a repeated measures factorial ANOVA. So we'll click on Analyze, General Linear Model, and then we'll go to Repeated Measures. And we're prompted here, before we can start uh, actually plugging the variables, uh, we're prompted with this option to actually name our independent variables. So if you recall, we have created variables to represent all the different combinations of the dependent variable, but we still have to specify to SPSS what the independent variables are going to be. So in this case, we're interested in whether the type of movie, so either comedy, drama, or action, influences uh, satisfaction, but we're also interested in knowing whether watching it at home or the theater influences satisfaction. So in this case, we are going to create two uh, measures here. So the first one we'll call it uh, movie, and movie has three levels because there's three types. So we have comedy, drama, and action. So we'll click add. And then we have to add a second uh, variable here to represent the other variable, which is location. And in this case, location is theater or home, so it has two levels. So it's important to pay attention here. Uh, if you were to flip the order of these, it's going to change the order of the options that appear in the next dialog box. It's not a big deal. It's just important to make sure that you recall which one comes first. So if we click on define, we are prompted with our next window here. And essentially, SPSS has laid out all the variables that we need to plug into this analysis in order to make it run. And none of these other boxes are going to be activated until we've identified enough variables here. So for a 3 by 2 design in a purely repeated measure uh, analysis, we should have six different variables to represent the six different cells. So if you count here, we have six. So the order that we put the variables in here is very important because you'll notice the 1, 1, 1, 2, 2, 1, 2, 2, 3, 1, 3, 2. So what the 1 represents on this column is the first, or sorry, the numbers on this side here before the comma represent the first independent variable, and then the second one here is the other uh, independent variable. So in our case, since we'd entered movie first, uh, it has three groupings for the first one, and then we'd entered location here for the second one. So it's just important to make sure that you're consistent. So 1-1 one, one is what we want to be considered the uh, first group on both variables. So in our case, it's probably easy just to stick with the order that things appear here. So group one is going to be the people who watched a comedy at the theater. And that's, sorry, that's one, one. And then it's important that when we enter the next variable, that the one still represents comedy. Okay, so we don't want to enter a drama or action there because it's going to screw up uh, which groups are compared for the first level here. So we need the one to be uh, comedy. And since we already entered one theater, the two is going to be uh, Sorry, the 2 is going to represent home. So now when we get to the next variable here, the 2 needs to represent a different movie. So if we stay with the order we have, it needs to be action. And we've already specified up here that theater represents uh, group 1 and home is group 2. So what we wouldn't want to do is something like this, where we've now kept action consistent. So action's group 2 on the movie variable. However, we've just switched up these two variables and now home is coded to a 1 in this grouping. So we actually want to take that out and we want to put theater here and then we'll put action next. Okay, so the 2 should be consistent everywhere here, the 1's are the same and then here we have uh, 1 there and 2 and this leaves our last one so we're going to add drama theater and drama home and that is everything. So again, it's not a bad idea just to double check, okay are my ones the same all the way on my uh, for one of my independent variables? So if we look just at theater, we have here theater equals one, theater equals two, theater or sorry, theater still equals one and theater still equals one. So we're good. Then on the uh, home side, we see here home is two, home is two, home is two. We're good. Now looking at the other independent variable, the type of movie, we can see comedy here is one, so that's consistent. Action is two and drama here is 3. So it's really important to double check this step because if any of these boxes are not in the right spot then um, it's going to give you drastically different results. 
Uh, if it's easier for you to name all your variables this way, great. If you have another way of naming them, even better. Sometimes it's helpful to draw out the different cells and combinations so you know exactly what you should name your variables and how they should fit with it. So once we're here, um, we pretty much set this up like a regular repeated measures ANOVA. Uh, so we can skip things under model contrast. Uh, plots will give us a visual of where all the group means fall, so it's very helpful for interpreting all of the effects. So if we click plot here, you'll notice that you get to, uh, you have to pick which one will be on the horizontal axis or separate lines. So in this case, um, I find it easier to put the one with more levels on the horizontal axis and then the one with less on separate lines. So in this case, movie has three levels, location has two. So we'll do that, click add and click continue. Uh, for post hocs, um, we can go in here and actually select, oh sorry, uh, that's the wrong post hoc thing. So this, sorry, this these post hocs are for independent measures only, and in our design we only have repeated measured. So there are not there's nothing to select here. Um, under save, uh, you can ask for other values which we don't need for this course. And then finally, options. This is where we're going to want to ask SPSS to generate the descriptive statistics, the effect sizes, um, and then uh, you don't need to worry about any of the other things for now. And if, uh, let's say that we did have a significant main effect but a non-significant interaction, we would want to interpret the, um, we would want to interpret the Bonferroni post hocs for uh, our main effects if they have more than two levels. So in the case of movie, if we had a non-significant interaction and wanted to look at the post hocs, we would add this here and we would actually click the compare main effects and then select Bonferroni. So we'll ask SPSS to do it, but we only need to interpret this if our interaction is not significant. So we can click OK and we're actually ready to run the analysis. So I'm actually just going to hit paste and run it this way so that we can also add the syntax a bit later if we need to. So just running this, we'll run the main effect analysis as long as the as well as the post hocs on the main effect for movie since it has more than three levels. Uh, we'll decide if we're interpreting that or not depending on what our interaction effect looks like. So if I run this, we get our output box. So the first thing we get is a little summary of which variables we specified to which group. So we have two levels of movie, one, two, and three and within each level of movie, two locations, so one and two, one and two, one and two, and we can see here that our variables still reflect that. Next, we have the descriptive statistics of each of the six groups, so we can see them here as well as the standard deviation. We notice that we have an N of 20, so since this is a purely repeated measures design, this means it's the same 20 participants in all cells, so we only have 20. Next, we have the multivariate test results. So when we're looking at main effects, you won't need to look at this. However, when we run simple effects, you will have to look at this output. So you can skip that for now. Next, we have our Mockley's test of sphericity. So SPSS generates this automatically. Um, and you'll notice that we do have an issue with sphericity for our main effect of movie. We have a little no value here for location, and then we have a non-significant value for the interaction, so we don't have an issue here. Um, so what this means, this little dot here in the zero, uh, this means that it can't be calculated, and the reason for that is because in location we only had two levels, and if you recall, sphericity is looking at the variance in the different scores and whether they're the same, and if you only have two levels, it means that you're only calculating one different score so it has nothing to compare it with, and therefore it can't uh, actually run the analysis. However, for movie, we did have more than two levels, so we could compare the difference between uh, those, and in this particular case, we have a problem. So if you recall, you're going to look at this value here, and if it's larger than 0.75, you're going to make the Hunfeld correction below, and if it's uh, smaller than 0.75, you'll stick with Greenhouse Geyser. So if we proceed to the next table, we actually have the results of our main effect analyses. And you'll notice that SPSS has generated an error term for each main effect. So we have movie, error term, location, error term, and then the interaction in error term. So for movie, we're actually making that greenhouse geyser correction. So this would be the F and that we'd want to interpret. And these would be the degrees of freedom right here. 
uh, so this one and this one here, 19.98. Um, in the event that we don't have a significant interaction and we're focusing just on the main effects. So we can see here though that we have a significant main effect for movie. Um, for location, we had no issues with sericity since it's impossible with only two levels. So we're automatically uh, interpreting the sericity assumed and we can see here that we do have a significant effect. So that means that location has an impact on satisfaction. So does movie. However, we can see here that the uh, interaction is also significant. So this means in this particular case, we're not going to continue looking at these two main, main effect analyses and we're going to focus on the interaction. Had there been a problem up here with the interaction, we would make the same correction using the greenhouse geyser uh, and the adjustments down here. However, in our case, we don't have a problem, so sphericity can be assumed and we can assume that our f of 25.5 one one for two and thirty eight degrees of freedom is significant. So this means that we're actually going to be interpreting the simple effects and that we need to rerun the analysis with uh, the syntax for those effects. Uh, I'll just continue through the rest of the boxes here to show you what is in or not interesting. So you can ignore the contrast box. Um, for now you can also ignore this test of between, between subjects effects. We'll look at that shortly. And then we can see here that SPSS has run the pairwise comparisons for our movie main effect. Okay, so we're looking at the difference between comedy and drama, comedy and action, and then drama and comedy, drama and action, etc. And we see that they're all different. However, for this particular case, we're not interested in this main effect, so you can just skip it all together. And finally here we have the plot of the memes. So we can see that uh, group one, which was, sorry, uh, theater, looks to be generally more satisfied than the people watching the movies at home. So let's go back to our main analysis and we're going to add the syntax so that we can look at our simple effects. Okay, so if you recall, we are using this e-means syntax tables where we multiply independent variable 1 by independent variable 2 and then we compare just the one independent variable and then we do the opposite. So in this case it's important that we grab the proper variables to plug into this formula. So it's actually going to be this WS factor line here. We have movie which has three levels and location which has two levels. So it's important to take those two names here. So if we copy this, we can just stick, pretty much stick it anywhere uh, in the analysis. If you delete this line here, it's going to just take away the post hoc analysis we already did. So why don't I do that? And then we need to replace um, variable 1 with movie. And then variable 2 will be location. And then we have movie and location. So these two lines are going to give us all of our simple effect comparisons. So let's click run and the top half is going to stay the same. Uh, it's our main effect so we can see here it says general linear model. Uh, we're looking at all these exact same tables so we can keep scrolling down and then we have here it says movie times location and if we keep scrolling we have movie times location again. So this is where we actually have all of our simple effect comparisons. So the first thing we have here are just the actual means of the different groups. Uh, so you can see this here. So for just people watching comedies, we can see that the people at home and the people, oh, sorry, people at the theater, people at home had these means. For just drama, we see home, theater, and for just action, home and theater. Or sorry, other way around. So theater, home, theater, home. So the next thing we have is the pairwise comparison. So this is like our post hoc analysis. And if you recall, it's using the least uh, significant differences to make uh, the comparisons. And all again, all we're looking at is whether this, the comparisons are significant or not. So in this case, it's doing it once for people who watch movies at the theater and once for people who watch movies at home. And we can see all the different comparisons here. So what we can see for the people who watched movies 
uh, at the theater is that there was no difference in satisfaction between groups one and two and one and three. So that means no difference between comedy and drama and comedy and action. However, when we look at um, action and drama, we notice that there is no difference between the two groups. So that applies to when people are at the theater. However, when people are not at the theater and they're at home, we can actually see here that all of the groups are different from each other. So it means that the people who watched comedies reported different satisfaction than the people who watched um, dramas, and then those people also repeated, uh, reported rather different satisfaction from the people who watched action movies. So in order to get our F values, so the uh, variance ratios for these particular comparisons, we have to actually go to the multivariate test table for uh, repeated measures, simple effects. So if we're looking at a simple effect that's being, or comparison that's being done with repeated measures variable, SPSS is actually not going to generate a separate F table, and we can just interpret the multivariate test table here. So what we have are a bunch of corrections, but you'll notice that they always have all the same values, so you can report really any of these. So for what we see here is that for people who watched the movie uh, at the theater, there was an F for 2 and 18 degrees of freedom that was equal to 106.59 and that this was significant. So this is the F you would report for that simple effect and then if we were to look at the differences between movie for people who watched at home we can see that for 2 and 18 degrees of freedom we had an F of 283.5 which was also significant. So what this means is that there was a significant difference for people who watched movies at the theater uh, and there was also a significant difference for people who watch movies at home. And then if you look at the post hocs on those simple effects, you can see that for people who watch movies at the theater, there was no difference between those who watched uh, action or drama, whereas for those who watched it at home, there was differences between all groups. So that's one half of our simple effects. And then the second set of tables gives us the other half. So we can see here that now we have the three movies and then we have the means for both groups within movie. So we have comedy, drama, action, and then we have the scores for people who watched it at theater, home, theater, home, etc. So the first table here again gives us the different comparisons, except this time, since it's only comparing two groups, we can just pretty much skip this table and go right down to the F table because a significant result here is going to be equivalent to a significant result up there since we're only comparing two groups and that is whether people watch the movie at home or at the theater. So looking at the comedy only, we can see that for 1 in 19 degrees of freedom, we have an F of 28.5, and that this is significant. For 1 in 19 degrees of freedom, we have an F of 46.77, er, which is also significant. And then finally, for the action, sorry, the, uh, yes, the action group, we can see that for 1 in 19 degrees of freedom, we have 489.93, as our F, which is very significant. So in all three groups, it means that there are differences between the means. So that means that home and theater is different for all three types of movies. So looking here at the actual group comparisons, we can look at, the, or sorry, the plot of the group comparisons, we can actually confirm what our simple effects told us. So if we look just at people who watched movies at the theater, we can see that those who watched a comedy were much more satisfied than those who watched a drama or action movie, and then we'd seen in our analyses that there was no difference between these two groups, and visually that looks appropriate. Then looking at the green line for those who were watching at home, we can see that all three groups are significantly different from each other, and that uh, the comedy was the most satisfaction, followed by the drama, then followed by the action movie. Now on the other side, looking at just those who watched a comedy, we saw a significant difference where people who watched the comedy at the theater had more satisfaction than those who watched at home. And then we saw the same trend for just the uh, drama, and then the same trend again here for the action movie. So once you've reported all your Fs, and you can interpret all of these different comparisons, if you recall, there's always going to be a uh, the, the same number of simple effects as there are levels in your design. So a 2 by 3 design will have 5, a 3 by 3 design will have 6, etc. Finally, we will finish with a mixed factorial ANOVA.
Next, we'll look at a mixed factorial ANOVA design. So in a mixed design, we have some independent variables, or just one, that are measured at the repeated level, and one or more that are measured at the independent level. So in this example, we're going to look at students' reported energy at the beginning, middle, and end of the semester, and whether this varies by gender. So we have two independent variables. The first is time. So we have energy, sorry, sorry, we have energy start, energy middle, energy end. So let's see, three time points uh, measured throughout the semester, and it's a repeated measures design. And then we have gender, which has two levels, male and female, and that was just measured once. So to set this up, uh, again, it's important to make sure the variables are named properly, which we've already discussed, but we have, we can see here that we have our three levels of our independent variable marked clearly. So to do this, we're going to go back to general linear model repeated measures, and this time we need to specify the repeated measure variable. So in this case, it'll be time, and that's three levels because we have start, middle, and end. So we can add this and click define. So we'll take the three variables and we'll enter them here. Since we're only dealing with one uh, measure, it's pretty straightforward just which one is one, two, and three. So you can just enter those right here. And then in this box here, the between subjects factors, this is where we list the categorical variables that are measured at the independent level. So in this case, we're adding gender. So uh, for setting up the analysis, we can skip model, skip contrasts. Uh, plots gives us the option to visually inspect the data. So once you're dealing with a mixed design, uh, my preference is to put the, the uh, data of the same people on the same line and have separate lines for different groups. So what this would mean is that the time variable, that's the repeated measures variable, goes on the horizontal axis and then gender appears on separate lines. Uh, personally, I just find this a bit easier to interpret. So we click add and continue. Uh, post hocs. So in this case, if we wanted, we could try to put gender here and run post hocs. However, uh, since gender only has two levels, it's going to get upset. And uh, in this case, we would only need those post hocs if we have a non-significant interaction and we want to interpret our main effects on their own. However, in this case, we don't need to run a main effect on gender. We would want to get that main effect on time of semester. We would want to go through the options window and you would click time and then ask SPSS here to generate the uh, main effect post hocs for time. So we can also ask SPSS to get the descriptives and the estimates of effect size again. Um, this time, since we do have a, an independent measure, we're also going to check the homogeneity test. And we can click continue. And then there's nothing that we need under save. So we'll paste this right here. And now we have our second analysis. So notice that um, the syntax looks pretty similar in terms of how the, the, it's actually set up, except that we now have this word by here to indicate that it's uh, these three variables by gender. And then the other independent variable is listed here, time, as having three levels. So we'll run this to start, and we'll get our output. And so we have a list of both uh, sets of variables. So we have the three measures for time, and we have the two measures for gender. So we can see we have start, middle, and end, and we have one and two, male, female. So in this case, uh, these 20 people are measured on those three time points. And then we have the descriptive statistics for each group. So um, this is energy at the beginning of the semester for men and women, and then the energy for everyone uh, at the beginning, and then the energy in the middle for men and women, and then energy for everyone, and energy end, men, women, energy for everyone. So we can actually uh, just uh, skip this box's test of equality of covariance matrices, and then we can also, on the main effects, skip the multivariate test. So the next thing we need to look at is our test for sphericity. So in this particular case, um, it's running the sphericity test uh, on just the independent measure. 
So, sorry, independent measure, rather, that's, uh, I meant to say the other way around. It's measuring it just on the repeated measure, which is time. And we can see here that we don't have a problem. However, if we did have a problem, we would want to uh, do the same uh, correction here that we would do just to a regular variable. And then we have um, the Levine's task down here at the bottom. So it's looking at all the different groups, uh, and we can see that in this particular case, we have um, almost an issue here, but nothing major. And the important thing when you're looking at factorial designs is that if you do have an issue with variances, as long as the groups are equal, you can ignore it in the factorial design. However, if you have unequal groups, then you'd have to make the correction, etc. But uh, for the purpose of this course, you'll always have equal groups, so you can not worry about it if you run into a problem there. So let's go back up. Um, so after our sphericity test here, we have our first table that has the results of our repeated measures variable as well as our interaction. And then the independent measure is in a separate table on its own. So what we can see here, uh, just looking at this, is that when we look at just time and we're using the sphericity assumed uh, row, that we have a significant effect for time. So the time of the semester has a significant effect on energy. Then if we look at the interaction, we can see here that although it's a little bit less significant, it's still smaller than 0 0.05. So there is a significant interaction between time and gender. And then we have one error term that's shared for the main effect for time and the interaction. So you might be wondering where the gender uh, main effect is, and it's actually it's in its own table. So you can actually skip the contrast box, and then we already looked at the equality of variances box. You can skip that again for now. And then you're going to come all the way down to this test of between subjects effects. And what we see here is that we have an intercept, which you can ignore, but then we have gender and then the error term for gender. So what this actually is here, this value here is this, the F for the main effect for gender. And what we can see based on this significance value here is that gender does not actually on its own have an impact on uh, energy. So time of semester does on its own, gender on its own does not. However, since the interaction is significant, which we saw here, we don't actually care about time or gender on their own. We're going to look at time and gender together. So uh, again, we'd asked SPSS to generate these boxes here to look at the Bonferroni post hocs for time. However, since we're looking at simple effects, we don't need to worry about the main effect post hocs. So we'll skip this. Uh, you can skip multivariate tests uh, for now as well. And then finally, we can look at the, uh, the plot of the means. So what we can see here is that men start a little bit lower than women and then are higher than women even though the uh, energy is decreasing as semester goes, whereas women start a bit higher and then seem to decrease just about as much. So to figure out exactly what's going on here, we're going to run the simple effects. So we're going to close this. We'll get our syntax. And we're actually just going to add the same exact syntax to our thing here. And again, I'm going to delete this line on the estimated means and the Bonferronis. So we have to put in the two names of the variables. So we have time, which we grab from there, and gender, time, and gender. And the first comparison we're going to look at is time. Second one is gender. And with that loaded in here, we can run it, and we're going to get our simple effects. So we can skip everything at the top. It's just a du duplicate of what we've already analyzed. And then we have our simple effect comparisons. So what we see here is that first we're looking at time one, the difference between males and females, time two, difference between males and females, time three, difference between male and females, and we have the means there. And then it actually flips here, and the next table we have the pairwise comparison. So these are the post hocs for gender, so just males, uh, difference between start, middle, and end of the semester, and then just females, start, middle, and end of the semester. And then we actually have the F test below here. So it means that for men, uh, F of 99.65 for 2 and 17 degrees of freedom is significant, which means that for men there is a difference between the different times of the semester. 
And if we look up here, we can see that it's between all times. And then for women, for uh, 2 and 17 degrees of freedom, we have an F of 176.21, uh, which is also significant. And then if we look at the post hoc rate right here, we see that, again, for women, all of the groups were different from each other. So it means that they reported different energy in the start, middle, and end of the semester. Uh, same for men. So that's one half of the post hocs. Uh, if we go to the other half, and sorry, one half of the post hocs and simple effects. If we go to the other half, we have the means here. And then we see that uh, SPSS has generated the pairwise comparisons again using LSD. Uh, except this time, as you recall, since we're only looking at two groups for each level, we can actually just skip this all together and look directly here. And you'll notice that these probabilities reflect the ones right here because they're essentially linked. So what we have here is the uh, a slightly different table because we aren't dealing with a repeated measure in this case. So what this second half is doing is comparing men and women at the beginning of the semester, men and women in the middle, and men and women in the end. And since this is a independent comparison, it's actually generating a table called univariate tests. So what we can see here is that there was a significant difference between men and women at the beginning of the semester, because this is significant. So F for 1 in 18 degrees of freedom uh, was equal to 32.4, which was significant. However, we see that at the middle and the end of the semester, the F was not significant. So we have an F of 0.8 and an F of 0.2, which for 1 in 18 degrees of freedom were not big enough to be larger than the critical value, so the results are not significant, and we can therefore conclude there are no differences between men and women at these time points. If we look specifically at the, the group comparisons, we can see that same thing is reflected right here. So for time two, men and women, no significant difference. Time three, men and women, no significant difference. So if we scroll all the way down to our plot of our means, we can see that looking at each simple effect, so if there's five of them, uh, we can in now interpret what is going on. So looking just at men, so the blue line, we can see that their uh, energy decreased as the semester went on. So this was significantly lower than that and that was significantly lower than that. We saw the same trend in women, where they started higher and then significantly decreased in the middle and then significantly decreased again at the end. So that's two of our simple effects. Then if we looked just at, um, just at the start, we actually saw a significant difference here where women were higher than men. However, there was no difference here. They were statistically the same, and no difference here. They were statistically the same. So that covers everything you need for interpreting the mixed factorial ANOVA, and that's that. Thank you.